you will go ahead and turn to John chapter 19. And we'll go very quickly through John chapter 19. I wasn't here. I did watch the recording. Uh, Stephen did all right. Um, in John chapter 19, there is something that he mentioned, and I'm glad that he mentioned it because um, had I been here, I would have mentioned the same thing. And I'm going to mention it tonight also because there's two parts to it. And that is in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, there is a promise made to the serpent. And what is that promise that's made to the serpent? First prophecy. If you will. A what? His head will be. His heel will be crooked. His head will be crooked. Correct. I'm yeah, gonna put one. I'm gonna I'm gonna put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. So as we go through John chapter 19 and John chapter 20, if I could name them chapters, John chapter 19 would be the bruising of the heel. And that is that it seems as if all is lost and that God is losing. Because John chapter 19 shows this monkey trial that we have and, and we finally come up to Pilate and we see that he's continually saying, I find no fault in him. He's doing everything that he can to kind of get Jesus out of this. But as Stephen pointed out, Pilate wasn't in as much control as he thought that he was. And this was of, of God. And... So we see what happens, and that is he finally uh, delivers him over to be crucified. Um, they are upset about the inscription, and you know Pilate keeps the inscription the way that he's written it. Um, they certainly can't say that he's not a friend of Caesar then, because he just crucified it. You know what would have been an enemy of Caesar. And we also see in verse 23, Then the soldiers said when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments, made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. And the tunic was seamless, woven in one place. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast it for lots to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast out lots. And so, as we start in Genesis chapter 3, the fulfillment of all of these prophecies of the Messiah to come are being laid out and laid to bear here in this crucifixion. And we're not even done yet. Because John chapter 20 kind of gives us more prophecies that will be fulfilled. And we also see um, in this that um, then in verse 31, the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken just to kind of hurry things along. And by the time they get to Jesus, He's already dead. And I know that uh, it was spoken of about the water and the blood coming out whenever he, um, whenever the spear went into Him. Um, that basically means He'd been dead for about an hour or so is the way that I understand that. After these things, Joseph Arimathea walks up to Pilate and says, I'd like to have the body along with uh, Nicodemus. And, um, and it says in verse 39, Nicodemus, who had come first to him by night, and we remember that in John chapter 3. <clears throat> and um, so they take the body of Jesus, they bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. So remember, there's this linen wrapping around his body, kind of like mummification if, we, if you can picture that. Uh, and they, they uh, place it in the tomb. Now in the place where he's crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden of the new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So that's where they, they put him. Now, as we move into John chapter 20, if I could name that chapter, it would be the crushing of the head. Because we see that there was a bruise given to the son of the woman, or the seed of the woman in the fact that he was put to death. And Satan has got to be thinking of one. John chapter 20, as we go through this idea of the resurrection, 
There is a lot in here that is not mentioned in the other three Gospels. Some of it kind of goes along with it, but there's a very different viewpoint that John has of the resurrection. And if there's anything that I want to keep in mind of the resurrection is how important it is to us that we understand that this is not just some simple story, but that it actually happened. And um, just to kind of prove the point of that, in, um, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says this about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 through 17. If there is no resurrection, he's talking about resurrection in general and talking of two people who believe that there's no such thing as a resurrection. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then what? Christ was not risen. He's not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, well then what's the result of that? We're pre we're, I'm standing up here for no reason at all and you are sitting in these pews for no reason whatsoever. You are living a life that has no purpose. He goes on to say, and if the preaching is in vain, then your faith is in vain. And in verse 15, he even says, we're found misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God and what we saw. And what is it that they testified about? Christ. That there was a resurrection. That Christ was raised again. But He did not raise Him. If it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That's how important John chapter 20 and understanding that this did happen, that's how important it is to your soul. Because without it, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus would have been just another man who died, just another prophet, just another philosopher, just another man. But there was something special about Him. And the reason that we kind of, and I really want to kind of go into this, is because John wrote this book for a very specific purpose. And this is the culmination of all of that. When you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you look at the signs and the wonders that's there, and you look at the teachings that are there, what we see is a lot of those um, writers trying to profess that Jesus is the Messiah. What we see in John is something a little different in the fact that he's trying to prove that Jesus was in the flesh. That He was fully man. He was fully God. And these signs and these wonders show that. And this is the biggest sign that you will ever find about who He was, the Son of God, and who He said He was. So as we move to John chapter 20, kind of keep that in mind. We're going to read Mary Magdalene's story about this. Now the focus for John becomes Mary Magdalene in the resurrection or in the empty tomb rather than the other women. And I don't want to get in too much lost into the weeds, but there are some differences that we see here, but it's only a difference of perspective, not because it's something that is contradictory to the others. And if you have questions about that, I'll be happy to talk to you later about it. I just don't want to spend a lot of time on the differences whenever we're trying to move through what John experienced and why he was writing what he was writing. So, let's go ahead and start. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Um, Paul, do you mind reading that for us, please? Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb earth while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away their Lord out of the tomb, and we 
do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciples, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head. Not laying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must raise again on the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, in, um, in this we see it's what day of the week? It's the first day of the week. Uh, Mary Magdalene, she comes very early to the tomb. What was the lighting outside? It was dark. It was actually a pretty long journey she would have had of a few miles, so she may have started at dark and kind of got there right as, you know, starting to lighten up a little bit. Um, but she was able to see that the stone was what? It was removed. And what is, when she sees that, panic sets in. And what does she think? Someone has stolen the body. It doesn't say that she looked inside to verify that. It just says she sees that. Um, she saw the stone already taken away from the from the tomb. So she runs from the tomb to go get who? Peter. And so Peter comes, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that to be who? John, the writer of the book. And um, you know, it's funny to me. John never mentions himself, you know, in this, and how he stays in that that, that mindset. It's beyond me why he's writing it. He never does say I. Now, what he does say is there's a race, not a win. But we do see that. So they both run out to there, and they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So there's anxiety caused by that statement. And so what do they do? They run out. They're going forth to the tomb. The two were running together in verse 4. The other disciple ran ahead uh, faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, notice what happens here with this. And I do think that this shows the, that this really happened because of the very intricate details that we see here. Whenever he says... I beat him there. He's very specific about in verse five, stooping in, stooping and looking in. He never does say that he goes inside until later. So he says that 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 uh, I looked in, and what did I see? What did he see? Well, the there. Kind of there. Now we see Peter comes in in verse 6, and he even says in verse 5, but he did not go in. So he's very specific about that. And that's why it tells us that this is really an actual eyewitness account of what happened there. And then in verse, uh, verse 6, and so Simon Peter also came following him, and he enters the tomb. And he goes inside the tomb, and he sees the linen wrappings lying there. And then there's something very specific about that. And what is it? The face cloth was separated and folded. This, this is not a 10 by 10 hat. Right. This is, yeah, it's a veil that would have went over them. Yeah. And so... It's folded up, it's laid aside, it's rolled up and laid aside. 
And then it says in verse 8, so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then enters. So something happens here that causes him to go inside also. And I don't know, you know, the whole what was going through his mind. He doesn't really kind of let us know there. But there's something about the way that that was folded up and the way that those linens were laid. And Peter evidently relays that somehow and then he enters in. And then we see, and he saw, and he believed. So however these linens were laying, looks kind of unnatural if it's something that somebody has taken him. It, they're undisturbed. Now remember... I go ahead. it was folded. I mean, you go in and steal a body, you don't take time to fold the napkin and lay it. <laughs> exactly. And remember what it says in verse in chapter 19 about whenever they took the body, what did they do? They wrapped it in linens. And so these linens still seem to be sitting there the way that they should, but this one piece was folded. Now how that happens, I have no idea. I just know that there was something odd about that and odd enough that, the, that John remembers it. It is seared in his memory in order to present it to us. And we also see that when he sees that, he believes. And so there's something unnatural about what happened there. And you know, I'm not saying it's miraculous, I'm just saying something was out of place, out of sort, that he took note of that. And you know, whenever you see something like, uh, like that, all those other little tiny details kind of go around and you start remembering all those other small little details like I didn't go in, I just kind of peered in, saw them, and then Peter actually went in. And so they said, um, but they did go away who had uh, first come to the, uh, to the tomb and on verse 8 also entered and he saw and believed. And yet, for as yet, they did not understand the Scriptures. Now they knew that Jesus was gone. Did they believe that his body had been stolen and moved? That's really kind of the question. I think they did. You think so? I do. Okay. Because of the confusion. I know we know Mary Magdalene did. I think the only other question of questioning what I just said would be the fact that it states that. He, let's see, where am I looking at? Um, he saw and he believed. So he understood maybe a little bit of it, but maybe not the whole complete picture yet. Right. There's really no indication about what that means that they believe, whether they believe Mary Magdalene that someone stole him or whatever, but there is something about the way that stuff is folded up and everything else that looks unnatural. That's why I tend to believe that they thought that he had actually raised from the dead. Now, they may not have understood, and it says in verse, uh, verse uh, 9, they did not yet understand the Scriptures that he had to raise again. They didn't quite understand all of that, but that he did raise from the dead. He was not there. And there was something about the way that that played out. Go ahead. It, it specifically is talking about John believed, and it's we've had occasions like this in our life where where we're not sure what's going on, but then all of a sudden it begins to dawn on us. And we don't immediately share that with other people. It's just we, we've internalized or begun to internalize what's happening. Here, and that's what's happening with John. He's just like, it's he, coming you can together. imagine that thought, oh, he's been raised, but he hasn't connected all those scriptures that right. would just, you know, open up all of it to him. Yeah, and and that's and I guess that's better articulated um, than what I just said. But um, we do know this that something has clicked for them that they now believe. And now we see um, in verse uh, 10, so the disciples went away again to their own homes. Now, the story doesn't end there. Because now you have, but Mary, Mary was standing outside the tomb, and she's weeping, because what does she still believe? 
Body. Body's gone. There's something wrong here. And so as she wept, she stood, stooped, and looked into the tomb. Now, when she looks into the tomb, does she see the linens? Two angels there. There were two angels there. So she's having a much different experience with this than what they did. And we see that these two angels are there and they're sitting in, in, in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laid. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, Because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Now, how is that even possible? <laughs> Sometimes grief puts us in a funky place. Yeah. Well, you know, we don't really know how he was dressed or anything like that. But we do know here very shortly she's immediately able to recognize who he is. And when she had said this, she turned around and Jesus saw Jesus uh, there, did not know it was Jesus. In verse 15, Jesus said to her, oh, Why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, What? Well, if you took him, please tell me where he is so that I may take him and uh, take him away. Now I want you to think about that. Here this woman is carrying around a dead body with all of these aloes and perfumes and all this kind of stuff wrapped around it, you know. So she, her grief, you know, is... I, I will do whatever I have to do to take him away. And then after that, when she had said this, she turned around, I'm, I'm sorry, in verse um, 16, she said to her, Mary. Now, remember the scriptures that we talked about in, uh, in John where he said that I'm the good shepherd. And what does he say about his sheep? They will know my voice. And I do believe that that, that, that was written in there for a very specific purpose. I, I think that you know we're, we're seeing something here with Mary Magdalene's story that the other Gospels may or may not really kind of lean to. But because John has already spoken about it, you can see how John is kind of threading the needle for us to be able to kind of get so that, why we under, or, so that we can understand all that he understands about what's going on. Now John wasn't here for this, so he's taking Mary's account of this and he's writing it down. And it says, and he says to her Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. So she knew immediately whatever it was, his voice, she heard it, and she responded appropriately to it. So I do not believe that that, again, I, I believe it was put in there for a very specific reason. I don't believe that it. it's just kind of in passing. But that she um, recognizes his voice. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. So, why does he tell her, Don't be touching me? Have a doubt with you. Yeah, right. She did, obviously. It doesn't say that. It's a lot here it doesn't say. Even her saying the two angels coming. Uh, cushions the bow. She doesn't even bat an eye at the two angels, it doesn't say. I mean, it's kind of no. like she was almost expecting them to be there, you know. But, I mean, that would have been something for us, but like they just ask her a question and she answers. Yeah, she took his hand yeah, now it's a little different. Uh, something experience. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's a there's a lot of different theories about Jesus' body, you know, outside of secular from the Bible to, to think about all these things. And not to be gruesome, but kind of going back to some of the details. You know, if you think about what happened to Jesus' body, and then somebody going in and stealing that body and taking all the wrappings off makes no sense, right? So that's kind of point one. But then when Mary gets there and she sees two angels, 
for me, I would think that that was a comfort to her. You know, there's something else. No, maybe, maybe it's not that Jesus' body was stolen. You know, I could put maybe a few things together here, the linens, the cloth being folded up. But now there's supernatural beings in front of me where Jesus had been before, so maybe she's at ease at this point. Still in a confused state, I would think, but at some point I would think she's probably in a better state than what she was before. Steve, you have something? Um, her grabbing onto him, some have tried to speculate that because he had a pure, holy resurrection body that nobody's actually supposed to touch with their father. Well, he's got 40 days ahead of him that he's interacting with people and eating and all right. kinds of things. And later, of course, we see where he tells um, Thomas, you know, touch me. You know, it's, it really is me. So that's not the issue. It's probably the case of where it, it, it'd be just like a mother who lost their child in a department store and when they finally get to their child, they just poof, grab them, hold on to them for dear life. And he's really conveying to her, hey, I'm not just going to disappear. Right, exactly. And I think that's I think that's the point. I'm not yet ascended to the Father. I mean, I, I am still going to be around for a while. And so there's, you know, but I... You need you have something you need to do right now. And so he gives her a mission to go on. Stop clinging to me. I haven't gone to the Father. I'll see you again. And but I need you to do something for me. And what does he say to do? Go to my brethren. Go to my brethren. Now I think it's interesting that he uses the word my brothers or my brethren. Is there? I, I don't know of any specifically in the book of John where he mentions that the apostles are his brethren. He's mentioned as servants. They're they're mentioned as um, my friends. But this is the first time. It's like there's a change in this language. Go tell my brethren. Um, now they were all connected physically through blood of the you know of the. Um, the, the type of that they were all Jews. However, this is the first time that I've seen that I see this, and I can't think of any other place. Now I do know there's a there's a place where you know they come in and say, "Hey, your brothers and your sisters are waiting for you," and he says, "My brothers and my mother are here," you know, and he's pointing to the people around him. Um, but this is a very specific thing, and it's even and it's even finer than that because he says. The message that I want you to tell them is this. Um, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet gone to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I send not to our Father, but I send to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. So there's almost like there's a separation of relationship between the Father and Jesus and the Father and them, even though they are still bound by the same Father. And I don't know if that's why he says that, but that just kind of struck me that he doesn't just say our Father and our God, because there are other times that he does use that type of language. Um, and I kind of read some commentaries, and they're just as confused as I was. So, um, I, you know, I just think that it is kind of odd that he does say that. Um, and that he uses those terms, my God and your God, and my Father and your Father. And if you want to, you're more than welcome to do a study on that to see um, what you think of that, if there is a difference. So, Mary Magdalene comes announcing to the disciples, guess what? I found him. And that, uh, and that he had said these things to her, you know, he says his Father and your Father, and, you know, she gives the message to them. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were uh, were what? They were shut. They were locked. That that word means either one, either shut or locked. Um, and there was a reason for that. And their disciples were there. And why were the doors shut? Fear of the Jews. For fear of the Jews, they have not stopped their bird dogging for these people. And for fear of the Jews. And it just says that Jesus just kind of 
came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Now, that makes my heart jump a little bit. And, you know, I, I have boys and they're always jumping at me trying to get me to, you know. But, you know, something like this where Mary Magdalene says, you know, gives them this announcement and then the same night, the same evening of the same day, this happens. And they're in a locked room and all of a sudden he's there. So, he is not bound by anything physical that's going to stop him from seeing them. Now, why is it that he says, peace be with you? I think he's still in that fear. I think so too. Giving him that comfort. Yeah, um, you know, again, when you think about what happened, it, it's kind of shocking what happened and he says, Peace. Peace be with you. And you remember the storm and all that kind of stuff. Peace be still. All these are kind of kind of coming together now. But he will repeat this a little later. And I think that he uses it a second time for a different purpose. And um, whenever he said, and whenever it says in verse 20, and we have said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So they knew it was him. And it was because of the evidence of the hands and the side, and we'll read that a little bit later about somebody else that needs that evidence. And um, it also says in verse 21, So then Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So remember all of the things that Jesus continued to say before that crucifixion, and that is, the Father has sent me to do what? Father's to do the Father's will. The Father's will were to teach, to show, and to lay down His life. And so, we're saying, you know, just as the Father has sent me, now I'm going to send you. But He says, peace be with you. And when you think about that, and when He says it the second time, it is not to calm fears because it says, his disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and then He says, Peace be with you again. Now, think about hanging up there on that cross and all the things that Peter did, and where's the rest of the disciples? Where are all? Why doesn't He chide them for that? Where did you guys go? You left me. This is the deeper showing of His love, His unconditional love, and that He knew, He knew, he knew what they were going to do. He knew why they did it. And there was there was no need for forgiveness because He loved them that deeply. And there's great peace in the world because now the head has been crushed. And we also <laughs> see that the slavery of sin is now broken. Yes. And He has come up. Here's the evidence. Now you have a job to do. Just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. You have to go and tell people. You have to be the witnesses. And so, when He had said, said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, you have been retained. They have uh, been retained. And again, the Greek tends to tell us that if you forgive, they have already been forgiven and kind of the same thing. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loose. Uh, that type of um, um, language. Alright, so we also see something else and that is that He breathes on them, the Holy Spirit. Now what does that make us think of? Remember it says that He breathes on them, the Spirit. Remember way back in creation. Life. He breathed life into them, you know, and I, and that's kind of what it makes me think of whenever uh, I read that and I thought that's almost like God breathing in life, and they now have a new life that they're facing to live, that they're they're being prepared to live now. Um, now, it says in verse 24, and we're going to move move on just a little bit, just because I want to get to the end of this. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus. What does that mean? Nope, it means the twin. 
was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to Him, we've seen the Lord. But He said, I doubt it. That is not what He says. He refuses to believe. And that's much different than just a little bit of doubt. He says, unless I see in His hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into His side, I will not believe. So, there's no doubt to Him that Jesus is dead. Now, I want to take note here about what day this all happened on. Because when we read it, we kind of get in there and we think that this happens over a multitude of days. This all happens on the first day of the week from John chapter uh, John 20 and verse 1 all the way to where we are now. But uh, Thomas being one of the twelve, he comes in. They now say this. So all of this has been on the first day of the week that he visits them. Thomas makes this declaration. I will not re I refuse to believe unless I can do these things. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Now, if you count those days, what day are we back on? We are back on the first day of the week because of the way that it's counted. So, keep that in mind. His disciples were again inside. Now, why would they be inside again? They were assembling. They were coming together for some reason, some purpose. Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and they liked their locked doors, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Now, he says this a third time. Now, why do you think he says this a third time to them? Do you think it's for one specific purpose? Or one specific per person, maybe? For Thomas. For Thomas. You know, they told him everything. Like, he was just standing here and he just said, peace be with you, you know. And so, he knows the story. And all of a sudden, we see this replayed again. First day of the week. And we see that he's... And then in verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here with your hand and put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And so all of this being played out again, and again, why do you think that Jesus chose the first day of the week twice to come to them? Do you think there's some significance to that day? Yes. And we see later on in um, Paul's writings and Peter's writings and you know uh, the book of Acts, we see that there is a very significant day that happens. It is no longer the Sabbath. What does the word Sabbath mean? Saturday? No. Everybody thinks that, but that's not what it means. It means Sabbath. It means Sabbath, which is the seventh day. And that's why it's very specific whenever it says the first day of the week. And every time we read that, it's no longer a Sabbath. It is completely different. It's a completely different day. Well, when all, all creation, you rested on the Sabbath. Correct. And that's why it's called a Sabbath. This is meant for the Correct. So, um, we see that you know he does choose the first day of the week to come to them twice. Um, and here he comes uh, for a very specific purpose to talk to Thomas and to show Thomas, Thomas, I can't have somebody, one of my disciples, just not believing. Now, to Thomas's credit, he may have said, I didn't believe, but he's where? But I didn't say, there's no touching. He's with the other disciples. Yeah, he's with the rest of them. And the fact that whenever we see this, remember back in John chapter 15, 16, 17, whenever we were reading that, what was the one thing that Jesus said you guys need to have? Faith. Love. You need to love one another. Because you got some trying times coming up ahead of you. And so we see them kind of together in this. 
and they haven't spread out like they were whenever Jesus was on the cross, they're not just spread out all over the place. They've actually started to come together. And they're doing this obviously on a regular basis as well. Enough so that Jesus is able to get all of them this time with this. Any questions or comments? All right. So we see, don't be unbelieving, but believing. Does Thomas touch him? He does not. It says that Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. He didn't need what he thought that he needed. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. Do you remember back in John chapter 17 whenever he was making that prayer and he prayed for the apostles and who else did he pray for? Us. People who would believe because of the words that they used. Because of their words. Because of their testimony. Because of their witness. And when Jesus says this, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe, He's talking about us. Now, I always thought verse 30 just didn't quite fit in. But we're about to see that it does very much fit in. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, one of the pictures we get out of this and those other accounts, these men were not gullible. They weren't just going to take anybody's word for it. Even John, with that early glimmer of belief, only had that after he got to the tomb. You know, there had been the report that came back that the tomb's empty, he's not there. They it, and I've seen the Lord. No, we don't believe her. And they get out there and they're still confused and wondering. And it, it shows us that, that these men were rational, reasonable men, just like you and I are. <coughs> but when the evidence was there, that was the end of the question. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I wanted to point out also, you know, when you look back at the non-believers that we've seen through John, and you see all of these signs that happened, and it says in John chapter 12, it says that He finally just kind of withdraws from them and He kind of turns to His disciples and He's starting to teach them. That's whenever we start seeing a lot of the teaching that goes on uh, after that point. But whenever He's there on Passover in John chapter 12 and He performs that miracle of uh, raising Lazarus and yet you still have people who wanted to kill Him and Lazarus, you look at the unbelief that he has faced. And now we get all the way to the two disciples that came to the tomb. They didn't believe it. They had to have evidence of it. We see Thomas here saying they, uh, he didn't believe it. They, he had to have evidence of it. But yet Jesus says, you believe because you see. However, the doubly blessed person is the one who does not see. And yet they still believe. And then John makes this statement, therefore, or because of what Jesus just said, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. I did not write this book to be an exhaustive um, thing, a, a book of everything that Jesus did. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Now you think of all those signs that we talked about, those seven signs that we talked about, He chose those very specifically, saying, if I can write this to these people and they can believe this, they will have everlasting life. But yet you had people who actually saw those things and they didn't believe. How much greater faith does it take to do what Jesus says. And that is to not see, but to believe. And so, our faith is built upon the witness accounts that these, that these guys have. And they're built upon some of the things that 
John specifically mentions here, that's where we build our faith. It is in the Word of what they wrote down. And yet we still have people today who find a very hard time believing what is written. And yet we see that's why the Gospel of John was even written in the first place. And so as we kind of look back at that, just realize that there were people who actually saw these things happen and they didn't believe. The apostles had a hard time believing that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. This statement that Jesus makes to Thomas about these people who would believe without seeing is what prompted him to write this book. And he wrote it from a very different angle than all the other Gospels that were out there, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was not written to be an exhaustive amount of signs and wonders, but I specifically chose these because if you believe these and you know what these are, specifically the one in John chapter 20, and that is the resurrection, then you have faith upon faith. And again, you know, it's just amazing to me that he makes that statement. And for a long time, I thought, you know, he kind of throws John chapter 20, uh, 20 and verse 30 in there. It just it kind of didn't make much sense. But now it does. Seeing all this unbelief, and we get to Thomas, and he writes it down for us. So here we are, 2,000 years later, half a world away. I don't know if John would have understood the impact of him writing down. He may have thought at the time there may be people who just didn't witness it, but they kind of heard of it and all that kind of stuff. But here we are, many, 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 many years later, still talking about it, still reading his gospel, and yet still having a hard time with some of it. We also see something else, and I'll, and I'll, I'll close with this. That that word in verse 31 when it uses the word belief so that you may believe, it's a twofold word in the Greek because of the tense that it uses. It means it has a start but no end. So you so that you may start believing or so that you may continue to believe. Because he was dealing with Gnosticism at the time, and that's why you see so much of the deity of Christ and yet the humanity of Christ also. Touch here. You know, this was a real man, and yet he was God. And that's why he wrote all of these things. He wrote it for us. It's been a very interesting study, and we'll finish out uh, John, uh, the book of John next week. But again, I uh, thank you for your patience and your time. Are there any comments or questions that need to happen before we dismiss? Go ahead, Paul. Much of the world agrees yesterday. Don't believe it, so. Yeah. Anything else?